welcome all of you in today's morning session. And I am going to invite first our co-chairperson, Professor P.K. Chattopadhyay and Professor Muzaharul Haq. Please, sir, Professor P.K. Chattopadhyay and Professor Muzaharul Haq, please come here in the stage. I am Dr. Fadusi Rahman in the MD course in Dhaka Medical College. And now our first speaker is Professor Dr. Henry Lee, Chair Professor, University of New Haven, Richard Commissioner, Connecticut State Police, Director, Research and Training Center. And now I will, we, all of you know who is Dr. Henry Lee. I am going to tell about him something, about his personal life. The Dr. Lee was born in China and grew up in Taiwan. Dr. Lee came to in the United States in 1965, and he earned his B.S. in Forensic Science from John Jay College in 1972. Dr. Lee continued his studies in Biochemistry at New York University, where he earned his Master's degree in 1974 and Ph.D. in 1975. He has also received special training from the FBI Academy and other organization. He is the recipient of 23 honorary degree. Dr. Lee has worked with law enforcement agency from 47 countries in helping to solve more than 8,000 cases. Dr. Lee is the founder of the Henry Lee Institute of Forensic Science, the director of the Forensic Research and Training Center, and distinguished chair professor in the Forensic Science of University of New Haven. Please, sir, Dr. Henry Lee. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a great honor to be here, to be invited to talk about forensic science and justice. I'm going to limit my talk to forensic services in the United States because talk about forensic science history, that's quite a bit. If anybody interested, I can make a copy for you. I have a long history about forensic science. Of course, the first organized acknowledging Forensic identification is by England, the Henry's fingerprint system. So can classify and uh, search, retrieve, to identify person. That's in 1897. However, the forensic pathology, the first textbook is published in China. It was published in 1248. That it's a very important treaty in forensic pathology. It covers everything about autopsy, the cause of death, <coughs> manner of death, but lack of two chapter. One is firearm, that's a by firearm. The second is explosive. Because in 1248, they don't have guns and uh, don't have explosive. They literally conduct autopsy on the street. Uh, I don't know how many of you have a copy. If you want to have a copy, you can contact me or my wife, Ha Xinping. Of course, Kim Pong made a great importance and impact in Asia. Just now, Steve gave a talk about a history of Yim Pong. Because Yim Pong, I met somebody, uh, Professor Chow was born in 1934. I was born in 1938. Uh, he was born in Hong Kong. I was born in China. In 1964, I went to United States. I don't know Professor Chow at all. And uh, somehow, because Yim Pong, they had called a meeting, invited me to give a talk. So two of us start meeting, start early days, later we become good friends. I really missed, uh, missed uh, Professor Chow. So a couple weeks ago in Singapore, they have a memorial lecture, uh, you invite me to give the keynote, 
the couple thousand people attend that uh, uh, lecture on December 5th. This year, in, in Bangladesh, I had the opportunity of being invited and uh, to attend. I met a lot of our old friends, of course, most importantly, a lot of young future forensic scientists. I really enjoy talk to them. I hope this Yimpang really continue to serve this education uh, purpose in the world. Now, the U.S. history of uh, uh, forensic science is star 1924. August Homer, that time he's a police chief and uh, he created the first forensic laboratory in Berkeley. <coughs> so that's the beginning of uh, U.S. forensic science. By 1926, the first comparison microscope was built to use to identify the bullet and the tool marks. But when I look at the history, I found out something. The law actually before the science. 1923, the first Supreme Court ruling, so-called Fry ruling. So all the law of evidence is follow this Fry. So in other words, 1923 should be the first most important stage in U.S. forensic services. That, although it's not related directly to forensic evidence, it's related to polygraph, lie detector, the Supreme Court rule inadmissible. So polygraph cannot be used as evidence. <coughs> By 1924, the fingerprint system, the training star come to United States. This is a book published in 1924. Now I have that book, probably one of the few left in the world. So some old timer, if you want to have a copy, let me know. I can make a copy for you. Now I can make an electronic copy. It's interesting to read those early days book. This book all beat up. It's almost fall apart. And uh, so 1921, that year, have a major case in the United States. The Sacco Vanzetti case. Sacco and Vanzetti, they are immigrant from Italy, come to United States. But that year, have a robbery case. A peril master was robbed and killed. A couple of his guard uh, was killed. So police have to solve the case, and Sacco and Vanzetti, two person was arrested and uh, charged for the crime and convicted for the crime but start a mass demonstration. Uh, people think that's injustice. Two of them did not commit the crime. Start a riot and the whole world start rally. So the court continue back and forth. Finally, Sacco Vanzetti both were hung to death. Until 1985, Harvard Law School and uh, NBC funded a project asking me to re-examine the bullet because this, the top is a sacco scum, the bottom, 38, is Vendetti. So those are the bullet recovered at the scene. They said those bullet match. It's fired from those guns. It was examined by uh, Colonel Cadell with his microscope in 1921. So what the project is ask us to use the modern scientific method, whether or not we can prove they're guilty or not. Unfortunately, the public doesn't understand. As a forensic scientist, we only look at the evidence. We're not the group to determine who is guilty, who is not guilty. That should leave the court of law. Scientists just deliver scientific evidence. I re-examined those 
with a group of a firearm examiner, the conclusion is some of the striations, they're consistent with Kamzo's gun, but there are many other striation mark is inconsistent. But uh, in other words, our new finding is inconclusive. You have to have the courage to call it. You cannot say definite and not definite because forensic evidence, many times it's not black and white. It's in the gray area. It's subject to interpretation. FBI laboratory was formed in Washington, D.C. in 1932. That's a historical picture. As you can see, the lab equipment is consistent with microscope. So early days, the forensic services basically limit to the identification. And here, 1937, Paul Kirk, Dr. Paul Kirk, become the dean of a criminology, uh, school of criminology in UC Berkeley. He started a modern forensic program, started using X-ray, start using scientific equipment. So he wrote the first book called per Kirk's Criminal Investigation, a Kirk Crime Investigation. The whole field in the United States, only one book. While I was a student, that's the Bible, everybody studied that book. I had the pleasure to meet him and uh, Early days, only few magazine have a book called Crime Investigation by Kurt, Paul Kirk. But today, we have so many journals and so many books, including many of my books. There are probably hundreds of uh, textbooks in forensic science. The forensic science field also changed tremendously from early days. Our training as a generalist. In other words, we know everything a little bit. But today, approach to specialization. The forensic medicine have some subspecialty, such as pathology, odontology, and sympology, entomology, radiology, nursing, toxicology, and psychology. Of course, criminalistic now encompasses fingerprint, firearm, document examination, all those, in addition crime scene investigation, and other new specialty area, such as forensic accounting, such as e-crime evidence. And uh, in the United States now, we have about 409 laboratory. Very small number. Serve 18,000 police department. 2,300 prosecutor's office, um, believe it or not, in the U.S. we'll have more public defender's office, so 3,000 public defender's office. We have uh, 2,400 medical uh, examiner or some areas, some state or city called coroner's office. The forensic education program, it's up and down, up and down, but today they have about 10 university offer doctor degree now, have uh, about 38 university uh, offer uh, master and BS program. Also have over hundreds university have a forensic science program, but not really uh, a independent forensic science program. They are under either biology department or chemistry department. Forensic scientists also we start helping law enforcement solving a case in state before we are passive mode. Now become a leading force. In 1978, I start joining a state police laboratory. That time it's basically so manual. And uh, that time nobody wear gloves. We all use our bare hand. Just pay attention on that. Because today, every case 
Innocent Project case challenge want to do DNA. So the all evidence, if you do DNA analysis, you're going to find some DNA. Once you find those DNA, they say this is the real suspect's DNA. The case should be reversed. Except they forgot early days when we collect the evidence, preserve the evidence, when the evidence goes to court, the lawyer handle the evidence, judge handle the evidence, jury handle the evidence, everybody handle the evidence, who do you know those DNA come from? Not too long ago, the biggest newspaper in United States, USA Today, lists 25 events shaped the world history. That 25 event, 14 of those forensic scientists were directly, indirectly involved. From 9-11 uh, to Iraq war, to Katrina, mass disaster, we have to identify thousands of bodies, to O.J. Simpson, to Clinton, Monica, dress to Oklahoma bombing, to massacre in Calabas, all those cases involving in forensic science. Every day, forensic scientists will work day and night, weekends, to serve the justice. Just now the president talked of the organization, talk about the justice not only for the individual, is for the society, it's excellent, excellent, talk. We also involved in police shooting investigation. The racial issue problem. If you don't handle properly in your United States, those are the cases, very volatile, can have a big riot, can destroy the whole community. The scientists have gained unprecedented power over the outcome. Not only criminal, a lot of civil cases now. They also involved in the food, water safety. They also involved in the highway safety. So much area forensic science not applied to. The next milestone in the history of forensic science is come the DNA. Uh, of course, in the United States, the first case, DNA case, entered the court in 1989. Now, I'm a professor Callis Muller developed PCR. So forensic DNA typing now moving into the new area now. <coughs> 1998, well, Alex Jeffrey introduced the DNA typing technique into the United States quickly in U.S. Everybody want to follow to do the DNA analysis. In U.S., any time new technique come, everybody follow. And uh, the next thing, the forensic scientists were not really ready to do the forensic DNA typing. So the early days, just a professor at the university or medical center, they start doing DNA. But next year, quickly, those DNA was expressed so fast, a lot of commercial companies say, that's easy, if you can make coffee, you can do DNA analysis. They even have a commercial one-hour DNA services. The following year, the court said DNA unreliable. Even the first professor testifying DNA, he retract, said DNA is not reliable. DNA has flow. Now all the laboratory adopt DNA. What are we going to do? In U.S., to solve a problem, they have a committee. The committee, first committee, organized by FBI. And uh, we sit there, talk about, they only serve tea and coffee. So the committee did not accomplish too much. 
By the way, the other four, three people already passed away. I'm the only survive, survivor. Then the next scene, they're holding an inter, international conference committee. Uh, anybody can tell the three people who is who? The middle one, you know. Okay, I'll give you a badge. Who? <laughs> okay, who, who recognized me? Who recognized the other one? Uh, Badoli, okay. All right, give, uh, give somebody recognize Badoli. Who is that handsome guy? We said, B.A. Alex, well, wonderful. Alex. Who is the, who is the guy in the middle? I don't know. <laughs> so, so I we become friends, but uh, for a while, then we don't see each other that much. Just so busy. One year, thanks to Professor Kumar, he invited me to India. He did not tell me who is the other speaker. Just tell me I'm the speaker. This committee, because they serve beer and drink, so we made some recommendation, but not good enough. In U.S., so finally, the National Academy of Science have a committee. We have Nobel Prize winner, we have all those scientists. I'm reckon, represent the forensic field because every committee needs a minority. Can you see that? A Chinese guy, Asian, right? Asian. And this one also, one Asian as a token representative. So this one serves wine and uh, steak for dinner. So we publish a book, DNA application to forensic. Just now I talked about Jeffrey, so I showed up. DNA, of course, moves so fast now to STR. So I showed up in his Alex. conference. Guess who is there? Alex. Alex Jeffrey. He said, Henry, you did not change a bit. I said, Alex, you changed so much. <laughs> this picture, how many years ago? Nine years. Nine years? No, another nine years. I don't know what Jeffrey today looks like. And uh, I'm still handsome, still look good, right? Yeah. Uh, of course, DNA, we keep on uh, te te technology, keep moving, and uh, with less, less sample, now we can do DNA analysis from the original 13 uh, CODIS core to later 18, now 20, the recent publication, 23, 26. So in other words, now have more uh, markers, loci, of course, uh, now DNA, a lot of database. Uh, in addition, the DNA has moved into the ancestry. Uh, we can do predictive DNA. In other words, the hair color, eye color, and uh, everything in the United States recently they just a ancestry DNA trace uh, solve a cold case, Golden Gate serial killer case. But that case haven't go to court yet. So whether or not court will admit those evidence, we don't know. But one issue with DNA is involving human right issue. I will keep all the database in the United States, they start challenge that. In other words, we cannot keep in U.S. only the person convicted to the crime. We cannot keep anybody else DNA in the data bank. With the coming of a rapid DNA and uh, all those issues, the DNA star being used by the defense lawyer every time a case they want to do DNA. So DNA created three difficult things. The first one is backlog, because every piece of evidence, they want to do DNA. The second one, the funding, 
because DNA is not cheap. Not the early days, the forensic identification, we just use our eyes to examine. Doesn't cost that much. Use microscopic examining or macroscopic examination is cheap, but with DNA costs a lot of money. Third, you found a trace of DNA, little tiny DNA. What you going to call it? And uh, especially with a mixture of DNA, you might be a sexual assault. Now, what you going to do? In 2009, National Science Foundation published this white paper, the study about forensic field. Forensic field was criticized so bad, said we are unreliable. All the traditional forensic identification star challenge us from the dental biomark to signature to shoe print comparison to bullet to tool mark to physical matching to crime scene arson fire pattern evidence every case now they're challenged all those states those are the cases pending think forensic identification have problem also a lot of laboratory got into trouble and a laboratory scientist one after another was accused um, bias accused uh, uh, forgery the evidence so the scientists now in us like squeeze between law and science every day this getting getting tighter and tighter uh, Unfortunately, they think just have a accreditation, have a standard procedure will solve the issue. With the old timer, we all know that not going to solve the issue. The first serology subcommittee to stand, standardize ABO typing, 1976. That's the group of us, probably two people still around, the rest are all gone. <coughs> Just like any community, uh, committee, need a Chinese minority token here. Uh, anybody know that guy stand behind? McGrath, he's the FBI laboratory director, the ball head person, and uh, now he passed away too. Uh, we come up with standard procedure but defense attorney keep challenging. Like accreditation, don't think this is new. Now laboratory got the credit. I was so happy we got the credit. The first accreditation team, we five of us become inspector in 1984. Again, that four people all passed away. I'm still surviving. And uh, look at how handsome I am that time, right? <laughs> So this issue, accreditation, standard procedure is excellent. We should do that. But don't ever think defense lawyer going to leave us alone. Sure enough, President's Committee of a Scientific uh, Advisor issue another report they openly again attack forensic field. Uh, say that's bad science. We're bad. Of course, the more senior people, some are passed away. I'm too tired to fight. So those committee basically consist the younger forensic scientists. And uh, Unfortunately, those hearings become forensic signs where the bad view and uh, even challenge the fingerprint. Now, fingerprint, the judge even rule fingerprint cannot use as identification. So, to all point comparison, no scientific basis. The next thing they challenge is hair fiber comparison. So, FBI have 3,000 hair cases all throughout the court. Say so that's the error because they use a word matching. 
You cannot match your hair. So case after case, now they start changing early days DNA. RFLP, DQR from, because now DNA you can do sequencing now. You, you found one sequence different, you say, aha, that's a mistake you did. So with all those guideline procedure, with so many subcommittee, study after study, I don't think this is the solution. It won't help. It won't help, but won't solve the problem. Because forensic scientists, early days, the public don't pay any attention. Now, we're under the scrutiny of the public. Every case, doesn't matter you work for prosecution or defense, the other side going to attack you. Sure enough, a lot of the DNA case is subject to challenge. They even have workshop for defense lawyer. How to discredit a truthful, truthful expert witness. If somebody tells the truth, why you discredit them? How to destroy a scientific witnesses? Uh, many laboratory under scrutiny. San Diego, 254 cases have to review. And the DNA scientist, DNA laboratory director, one after another result. They don't want to do it anymore. Because today, if they cannot discredit the science, they discredit the scientist. If they cannot discredit the scientist, they demeanor you, try to find something. For example, we all know Dr. Mollis, his accomplishment, his achievement. <coughs> he testified in court, they challenge him, not ask him his qualification, all about DNA. Say, when you in Berkeley, undergrad student, did you smoke a marijuana cigarette? That's nothing to do with the, his accomplishing DNA, but try to destroy. So here, a lot of laboratory scientists can't stand the newspaper. The newspaper now twist the fact, try to attack you, he commits suicide. It's not his fault. Why? What behind those? Because the civil compensation for those cases reverse. For example, this person, a judge ordered to give him 13.2 million. How much his lawyer got? 80%, 10 million. So all they need is one case. That's the motive, case after case, attack, even in China, they have that. The future of the forensic science, we're getting to a point now, the forensic scientists, we don't work together internationally, worldwide. Forensic science field, probably going to step back to 200 years ago. Because science is not black and white. Not always we can tell exactly black and white. With the uh, e-crime cases, now more and more people rely on civilian camera instead of uh, scientific evidence. Just have a videotape. Track your cell phone, GPS tracking, cell phone tracking, record checking, your computer data bank, and your camera. You think you took some picture, wipe it out, it's not there. They can get all the information. So why do forensic evidence? So with all those social media database, they can mine it. They don't need forensic evidence anymore. With artificial intelligence, with all those, we can pinpoint out. With satellite, uh, 
of course, you can check the license plate, you can look at the facial recognition, you can track somebody down every day, <coughs> just matching the image. So forensic view will enter a critical point. Truth and justice is resting your shoulder. I'm lucky I'm 82. I don't care anymore. But the younger forensic scientists, I don't envy you. When we enter the field, it's much easier. Now you enter a field, become heavier, heavier to lift this justice. We supposed to stand in the middle. Anything associated to the suspect, we report, we examine, but anything dissociated to the suspect, we equally report. Any statement, physical evidence can prove, we utilize. But equally important to prove, disprove. Any inculpatory evidence, we do our best. But the exculpatory evidence, we also should report it. They always criticize forensic science, scientists' lack of standard. But how about lawyer? Should they have a standard? Sure, they should. But unfortunately, when they attack the forensic scientists, if we are prosecution witness, they say we're biased. Doesn't matter what my result, they're going to say you're biased because my laboratory is under government authorization is under state police. If I testify for defense, same testimony, prosecutor going to say, I'm a higher gun. They spend money, hire me. Therefore, I give my testimony. So be alert, this is coming. The next thing right now in US, they challenge presumptive test. That's the test everybody use every day around the world. The first thing we do, now they say presumptive test is not reliable, should not use. Few tests should not be used. So with that, we recently, I even have a case. The newspaper said we make a lot of mistake and that this innocent person was convicted because presumptive test. But nobody report the credit card Victim's credit card found in the suspect's toilet. He stuck in the toilet. That's the evidence they don't talk about. Just talk about, say, 30 some years ago, the evidence, the new DNA excludes a person. Luckily, we was able to change this. So future, how to avoid become a victim. Listen to my advice. Keep all the notes, report, photograph. Those cases, lucky, I kept all the notes. I have an original picture, original note. Review all the file. Discuss the case with your supervisor or senior people. And uh, if they make a personal attack, retain a lawyer. Because many times in US, the laboratory just want to cut the loose, let the examiner on his own. The laboratory don't de defend him anymore or her anymore. The government just abandoned him. So like a scapegoat, so we should as a group organize some supporting people. A lot of professor or retired, we should volunteer our time to help out. I hope Yimpang should future have some kind of committee to help all those scientists because eventually this challenge going to bring United States, move to Europe, already started, Australia already started, going to come to Asia So, And uh, if you don't do any prevention, I'm sure a lot of young scientists going to suffer. And uh, so important, I said for us six scientists, we have to have standard, scientific standard, legal standard, procedure, technical, and 
ethnic standard. Equally, lawyers should have that too. Don't ever lower your standard. This only hold truth for the United States. A Gallup poll survey, which group of profession people can trust? Which group of uh, profession people cannot trust? What do you think the most trustful group is what? Which profession? Teachers. Anybody? Doctor? Doctor, no. Teachers. Teachers. Nurse. <laughs> Nurse has nothing to lie. Okay, they tell you the fact. But uh, give the person say, Dr. A. Xiaoping. The next one is doctor. Who say teacher? The next one is teacher. How about scientist? Clergy. The next group is engineer scientists. Police officer is not too bad, 52%. Now, which group is the uh, least trustful? Police. <laughs> Excellent. Give, give them uh, some. Reporter. Reporter. <laughs> Who worse than reporter? <laughs> Senators. Who worse than senator? Lawyers. Chicken, how you got? Look, I'm going to say that lawyer. Who lower than lawyer? Politician. Who worse than politician? In U.S., nothing here. Okay. President. <laughs> Who worse than the president? Car salesman. <laughs> okay, I want to thank you very much for your time and uh, be a winner, have knowledge in your mind, have courage in your body, have honesty in your heart, have friend in your life. I want to thank you, each of you, your friendship. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Dr. Lee, for forensic evidence and justice.